From the heart of pre-lights, the preprint highlighting service run by early career researchers and supported by the company of biologists, this is Spotlight. Hello and welcome to Spotlight, the pre-lights podcast that highlights the stories behind the most exciting biological preprints. We put a spotlight on the early career researchers who spearheaded the preprinted work. My name is Renier, and together with Matthew and Ethan, we'll be your hosts today. In this episode, we are pleased to welcome Bruno Velatini. Bruno is a postdoc working at the Max Planck Institute of Molecular Cell Biology and Genetics in Dresden, Germany. Bruno describes himself as a scientist interested in embryos and evolution, who loves microscopes, marine invertebrates, and vintage blogging. Today, we'll discuss his exciting and recent preprint entitled Patent Embryonic Evagination Evolved in Response to Mechanical Instability. Welcome, Bruno, and thanks for being our first guest. To kick things off, could you perhaps tell us how you got into research and specifically biological research? Well, I think uh, since I was in school, I was interested in uh, marine biology and biodiversity and science classes. So it was kind of natural to me to go into biology, like to study biology. So I started very interested uh, uh, in some like immunology mechanisms and in, uh, in, uh, in the diverse like invertebrates. And I started looking at this uh, like sea urchins, sea stars, fish. And, uh, and when I started uh, having these animals in the lab and we started to look at that embryos, then I kind of fell in love with embryos uh, and development and also like the evolution of development. So I started uh, really go into the evodivo field. Uh, and for me, uh, this is the most exciting thing is to figure out and understand what is this relation between uh, embryonic development and the evolution uh, of animal farms now. Great. So you are currently a postdoc, right? Yes. So could you just maybe tell us a bit about your ac academic career so far? So your story mm -hmm. up till becoming a postdoc working on this project? Yeah. So I am from Brazil. So I did my undergrad studies there. Uh, then I did a master's uh, there as well. I was looking into the uh, early development uh, of uh, sea biscuits, which are echinoderms. Uh, then I moved to Norway to do my PhD, uh, and I stayed in uh, in Norway for five years. And there I was studying, doing basically Evo Devo, so comparing gene expression patterns uh, across uh, different animals uh, and trying to understand evolution. So I did uh, many uh, marine invertebrates like brachiopods. Bryozoans, Nemertians. So I was looking into their development, doing cell lineages. And sometimes we don't even know where's the head, where's the mouth. Uh, uh, so it's a uh, really basic uh, 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 studies, like trying to figure out where, I mean, this cell will end up. I mean, is this a cell that gives rise to the anus or the mouth? Uh, so this sort of uh, studies. And uh, this is uh, super cool. And I, I'm really excited to study this uh, like non-model organism now that you need to go and collect uh, uh, in the field. So we essentially had to go and uh, get a boat and get them from the sea and <laughs> go to the lab. And uh, but they also have there's some limitations of what you can do with the embryos. So uh, we couldn't do so much like some fun functional approaches to perturb development, uh, for instance. So for my postdoc, I wanted to, I took a question that arose from one of the projects that I did during my PhD. Uh, and I wanted to uh, go a bit more into the, these functional approaches uh, to development and into morphogenesis uh, and doing uh, live imaging to like understand how uh, tissues move and tissues uh, fold. And, and initially I actually, uh, because I have this evolutionary background and I'm really into evolution, but I thought it would be a good idea to perhaps in my postdoc um, focus more on this developmental part and leave evolution a little bit aside, although my project had an evolutionary question on it. 
so uh <laughs> it's funny that I mean, I try to stay kind of away from evolution a little bit to go into development, but the project shit back to evolution uh, in the end. Mm. Actually, that very naturally leads to the follow-up follow -up question, which, which would be sort of describing the start of the project that led to the preprint. For example, did you talk to your postdoc, current postdoc advisor about this? How did the, the project take shape? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the project evolved uh quite a lot during the time here uh and it evolved for different uh reasons so originally i was um my goal was to figure out how the cephalic furrow forms and to do it in a way that i wanted to uh discover like new genes that were involved in the patterning of the of the structure so i mean this turned out to be a little bit <laughs> difficult and uh, uh, we we did find out uh, a couple of new genes that are uh, uh, involved in uh, in in the furrow uh, in the furrow formation in the patterny. And uh, but here at the institute, like in the in the MPI CBG, uh, there's a lot of uh, interface uh, with uh, physicists. So there's a lot of uh, uh, people working exactly on figuring out like the physical basis of development of uh, cell behaviors of morphogenesis. Uh, so I think this influenced uh, the, the, the project a lot because uh, I was, uh, I started interested in the patterning, but there was always the, like this lingering question of, okay, we have this imagination that doesn't give rise to any specific tissues and, uh, and then I thought, okay, maybe just looking, <laughs> like observing what's uh, how the embryo is is developing, something will come up. And and in the end, I mean, there was some weird things happening in the embryo, which was the starting point for this uh, uh, more physics uh, or mechanics uh, approach that we took. And also the I think one important thing was that uh, another PhD uh, joined the lab which is a, a, she's a physicist. And uh, this also gave the project uh, um, a st strong direction into this, uh, <clears throat> into, into the mechanics analysis. No? Um, for your PhD, um, you were more involved in the evolutionally the model biology side of things and it transitioned to a more mechanistic studies for your postdoc. Do you find that transition difficult for you? And um, is the learning curve challenging and can you elaborate on that yeah yeah for sure it was very challenging <laughs> uh, especially because the uh, drosophila uh, has like an in immense amount of uh, resources and and things to learn so in the beginning i was really overwhelmed by how much i needed to understand i mean new things about how to uh, I mean, do experiments uh, to understand uh, the, the function of genes and how uh, forces are <laughs> acting on embryos. And, uh, but it was, for me, it was really interesting to see uh, the, I mean, the approach of the Drosophila community, uh, because the Drosophila community is super open, is super organized. Uh, so, for me, that I was working with animals that essentially had uh, very uh, small communities or maybe no no community at all. Uh, so stepping into this, it was overwhelming, but it was really uh, informative to see. I mean, how you organize. Um, I mean, when you are learning a new thing, it's challenging, but it's also can uh, bring out new new ideas, and uh, then I think maybe it's worth it. I was wondering if there were any like major hurdles in this project overall, um, whether that's um, experimental or, um, or or whatever. Yeah. Um, well, I think the, the most difficult part was to um, kind of set the direction of the project at some point because. Uh, I started with this idea of discovering new genes 
related to the cephalic formation. But you can do this your whole life and not reach uh, some kind of answer. And uh, and I think the project really made a turn when I decided that I this was over. I mean, I had finished my screen for new genes, and that's what I got. And um, because it's this uh, was more like a survey, so I was I had a bunch of like candidate genes, um, like a hundred candidate genes that are genes expressed in the head trunk boundary, so they could be potentially involved. And then I started getting uh, fly lines that had loss of function uh, alleles for these genes or some deletions that were uh, deleting these genes and imaging like batches and batches of embryos under the microscope uh, and then trying to uh, score if I would see some like cephalic feral phenotype uh, and setting up this uh, this life imaging approach was challenging because when you are imaging lots of embryos over a long period of time many things can happen like uh, they can dry out and the microscope or the microscope breaks and you have to process all this data uh, that is also something challenging and uh, so i think i got kind of stuck in this uh, experiments and, and trying to finish this and i think i remember that just as, at some point i need to make the decision okay i i mean this is what i have and uh, i need to like move on so it was more like a, a personal hurdle uh, to take this decision. Was there also like a, a sort of a, a breakthrough moment, like a eureka moment in this project, like something that's, that you remember made all the difference? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the, uh, the turning point was uh, I had this uh, data on the um, on the gene expression. So I uh, had this new gene that I was uh, looking at. And at the same time, I was doing the imaging uh, of the of these mutant embryos. No. Uh, there was a small breakthrough, which is just like technical, but uh, uh, it's, I don't know, I, I'd like to <laughs> tell it because uh, I had this data, live imaging data of embryos. And, and I was taking these images and looking at them. But to look at this uh, data, it's huge data, and you need to somehow uh, project. You have a full 3D stack, but you need to project it, like flatten it out, do sort of uh, image processing algorithms to be able to see things more uh, clearly. And uh, I remember that changing how I did that actually made it possible for me to <laughs> see what was happening. So I was just using a simple like maximum projection of the data. And it was kind of difficult to see what was happening like on the embryo. And when I changed this to, to I mean, doing a, a kind of rendering of the surface of the embryo, then I started seeing things. And I think it was, it was really a small step that was just fiddling, you know, I was just fiddling with the methods and just trying to see better. But it made a huge difference on being able to see what, uh, I mean, how the cells were uh, moving and to uh, actually find out that the word is uh, yeah, buckling of the tissues happening, which was kind of variable. And uh, I mean, it was it's not easy to kind of detect uh, at first look. That's amazing. Thanks for sharing. I mean, I just wanted to ask where, what, you feel are the most important takeaway messages from this work when you talk to other people about this what would you tell them is the most important again take home message mm -hmm. here mm, well uh, so uh, the idea is that uh, in, inside when the embryo is developing you have all these tissue movements that uh, interact uh, with can interact with each other and cells they have this ability uh, to sense and respond to mechanical stimuli. And I think we are starting to uh, raise some ideas on how uh, this property of, uh, of cells can actually uh, maybe change the outcome of evolution. So uh, I think this is the, I mean, the core message that we are 
trying to yeah trying to put forward and it's also based on what we see in the cephalic furrow uh, so it's something that it's specific to drosophila but uh, we think that maybe this is also happening in other in other structures and other groups i've got two questions uh, yeah. first would be um so are there any questions you weren't able to answer in this project um and second might be where then does this project go now mm -hmm. um is this kind of the end of the line or is there somewhere something somewhere to go to in the future yeah yeah i think it's the starting <laughs> the starting of the line and um so there i mean there are quite a few things that we i mean we could not answer the, I think, especially regarding the furrow, because uh, the cephalic furrow, we, we, as far as we know uh, from uh, from uh, the data, I mean, it has no function. Uh, and uh, one thing that that I wanted to do, but well, we we failed, uh, is that I wanted to see if these ectopic foldings of the that happened in the head trunk interface was affecting the the patterning of the cells because the 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 blastoderm cells they are in drosophila they are super pattern you have all these rows of uh, uh of cells expressing different genes and and everything is like super organized and and uh one uh prediction it was that okay if you have all this variable buttoning of the epithelium maybe this is messing up the patterning and and I tried to look at embryos that were mutants, but then you have to get the embryo and fix kind of in the right stage. But since these ectopic bucklings are variable, it's not easy to, I mean, get them at the right moment. And it's hard to know, like, uh, even sometimes that they were there, but they just unfolded. I know. So yeah, this is one thing that we we didn't manage. But I think with more, Actually, we uh, so that yeah that goes into the next thing. So we, I mean, we raised this idea that uh, mechanics uh, can be uh, important for evolution, uh, and and we use this specific term like selective pressure, and uh, and this is a term that would mean that okay maybe this uh, instability in the tissues can be detrimental to the embryo and and this is something that uh, we are working on on uh, having a bit more evidence on on that as well uh, because this is super tricky to to uh, set up some experiments that demonstrates uh, at least some evidence that this instability can be detrimental uh, but this is something that we are working on and also it's uh it depends i mean many of these things they depend on uh experiments that are complex like the in this case we need to uh, block cephalic furrow formation without affecting the patterning yeah. so i mean we have some uh, ideas on how to do this and hopefully we will uh, have some answer uh, for that so I just wanted to mention your beautiful tutorial, right, about this work, mm. uh, and maybe also ask how you feel about about science communication in general, and also the importance of communicating your findings to a, a general, a more general audience, or or even other biologists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm a big fan of uh, science outreach and communication, and uh, I think there's a, uh, I mean, it's always important. So I think there's two aspects that I find uh, cool. One is uh, like using the social platforms or the web to discuss, uh, I mean, scientific ideas and findings. I mean, maybe with uh, like colleagues, I mean, you just put an idea on, on, I don't know, Twitter or Mastodon and then discuss with other people uh, what's happening. So it's kind of this live science. Uh, I find it uh, quite uh, interesting. And then 
communicating uh, the findings to I mean, to a broader audience is always uh, for me very fulfilling and uh, uh, because I think the most of it is the I mean we see such like wonderful things like under the microscope and uh, it's just it's a real privilege to be able to like work on on that and uh, see this uh, I mean super aesthetic embryos and processes and very fascinating things and 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 the internet and the web it allow us to I mean, really spread this uh so uh, uh, i think for me i'm really uh, motivated to put these images out there uh because uh, one thing that uh, one thing that i learned like on the when i was doing my masters i did a um, I made a little video of uh, what I had seen, you know, and what uh, are the images that I took, and I did, I posted online. Even like it was a year before uh, the actual paper was published. You no, know, I just made a little video, put some soundtrack, and posted online. And then I, it for the time it went viral. You no, know, it was spreading through mailing lists. And, <laughs> Uh, and then I realized that, okay, this, I mean, I, I was working in this very specific topic and animal, but I found that people are, I mean, really interested, uh, uh, and reachable, you know, and I thought that people would not be like, so interested in a random sea creature, uh, but, uh, yeah, but people, uh, are, are reachable. So I think this, this connection is very important. I, I want to zoom all the way to your origin story that you just touched on. You you set on a, to study evil duo quite early on. Um, I, I was just wondering what, what what how does it capture you? Why why do you set on studying development? Um, to to, to begin, yeah. In the beginning, yes. Well, uh, so I was in this lab. That uh, the name of the lab is comparative evolutionary physiology or yeah phys histophysiology and and so the main question of the lab was to looking into um, the immune responses of different organisms like tropical and antarctic so it was comparing uh, uh, like i don't know phagocytosis or some immune responses in animals that live a very different temperatures and one of these animals was sea urchins. So we had to uh, go out and collect sea urchins. Uh, I mean, I was, we, were, was doing, we were doing this in Brazil, no? and I was help, helping out them with this. And, and one of the uh, experiments that my supervisor at the time had done, and you always want to come back to, was to look at the I mean, when is the first time that the, the immune response uh, appears in the in development? Like in the when is the first time that these uh, phagocytes that I mean they 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 are, uh, they are active in adults, no? But when is the first time that they become active? And he did this experiment with sea urchin embryos, injecting yeast, the very early embryos, and uh, seeing. I mean, when these phagocytes started appearing and, uh, and eating the, the yeast. And for me, I think this was the first time like, I saw embryos. I saw that you can manipulate embryos, that you can inject. Uh, and I think this like, was, is what triggered uh, the, like, my interest in embryos. And we had these urchins there. So uh, this kind of enabled the, uh, like doing some experiments, fertilizing. And then when, yeah. When I saw embryos under the microscope, then <laughs> I think everything <laughs> set. Um, so I feel at least my last question would be, so, you know, it's an obvious thing that doing research is, is very hard. Uh, I was just wondering how do you keep your spirits up also while doing the, the, the preprint we just discussed, um, what do you enjoy doing outside of the lab? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I. So I like to uh, play bass. So I, um, yeah, I used to have a band when I was in Brazil. But one of the things that happened when I moved out was that uh, yeah, the band was no more. But I continue playing. So this is something I like to do. And um, another 
hobby that started during the pandemic was to uh, like cultivate uh, planted tanks. So it's this idea that we have an aquarium uh, that has uh, plants in it and it's a uh, low tech. So there's no filter. You just keep like a small environment in it and adding fish, adding shrimps. Um, so, I mean, it's something that started during the pandemic and I really enjoy um, yeah, tendering. It's like I have a small garden, but underwater, no. And that is it for this episode of Spotlight. All our episodes are available on the Prelights website. To keep up to date on each episode's release, please follow us on X, Mastodon, Facebook, or register on our website. Until next time. Mm-hmm.